moment this is me and my most masochistic Bill it's your brain has it really been 20 years since Kill Bill came out Conceived as a tribute to the Kung Fu films of the Shaw Brothers and released in 2003, it received glowing reviews and went on to gross $180 million worldwide. We open on a close-up of a woman in a gown. Her face is bloody. She tells an off-screen character called Bill that the baby is his and then BANG! She's shot. Chapter 1. The bride from the opening sequence arrives at a suburban Pasadena home and rings the bell. The door is opened by Copperhead. Without a word of explanation, they start fighting with a level of skill and precision that shows this ain't the first time. Things calm down enough to find that the bride is there for revenge, which she promptly gets. Chapter 2 Flashback to the aftermath of the wedding scene. Two police officers find the bride on the floor of a church where there has been a bloody massacre. They note that the bride is still alive. While lying in a coma, there is an attempt on the bride's life, which is called off at the last moment by an off-camera bill. Flash forward to the bride waking up from a four year long coma. She fights a pair of abusive hospital orderlies and escapes in a wheelchair. Chapter 3, the origin of Oren Ishii, one of the bride's assailants. An incredibly cool sequence done in a Japanese animation style tells the story of how she had to hide under a bed when her family were being brutalised by gangsters, and that she would later get revenge for herself by becoming one of the top 20 assassins in the world. Back to the bride and her escape from the hospital. After some intense self-imposed physiotherapy, the bride overcomes her leg atrophy and drives out of there in a the stolen truck. Chapter 4. The bride finds a legendary swordsmith and convinces him to make her a sword. Chapter 5. The bride hunts down Oren Ishii and kills her goons in an almighty bloody battle and then kills her. As your leader, I encourage you from time to time and always in a respectful manner to question my logic. If you're unconvinced a particular plan of action I've decided is the wisest, tell me so. But allow me to convince you, and I promise you right here and now, no subject will ever be taboo. Except, of course, the subject that was just under discussion. The price you pay for bringing up either my Chinese or American heritage as a negative is, I collect your fucking head. Just like this fucker here. The film Tarantino made before this was 1997's Jackie Brown, a well-written crime drama with complex characters and a consistent tone. That film may very well be Tarantino's most mature work to date. But Kill Bill Volume 1 is the most fun. This ain't no squirrely amateur. This is the work of a solid dog. It hits the ground running. The writing is sharp, the soundtrack thumps, the action is slick, and revenge is such a human emotion that it's hard not to get on board. And with a running time of less than two hours, it's lean for a Tarantino film. Welcome. You English? Almost. American. America. Welcome, America. Domo. My English very good. You said Dom. Can you speak Japanese? No, no, just a few words I learned since yesterday. People pretending to be someone they are not is a continued motif in Tarantino films, but even with that in mind, this scene plays a little funny to me. The bride enters the restaurant where retired swordsmith Hattori Hanzo works as a chef, and she pretends to have poor Japanese skills until she drops his name. 
Please, he. We are your ask. At Tori Hanso. At Tori Hanso, you eat a non you discuss. Why does she need to pretend she can't speak the lingo? I could understand it if the kitchen was out the back and the bride had to charm a waitress with a bit of chat. She could say, oh, I'd love to give my compliments to the chef. And the waitress would go to the back and say to the grumpy hot man cooking, come meet this lady. She wants to thank you for the meal. Then he comes out and bam, she's in Japanese mode. But there is no waiter. The bar is empty. She could just walk in and say in Japanese, hello, I've come all the way from America. May I please have a sword? You're like a samurai sword. I like this. This is the only part in which, to me, the writing didn't make sense from a character point of view. And if that's all I've got to moan about, then you're doing pretty well. What is it that makes a Tarantino script? Because the dialogue is so riveting i get them talking to each other i mean it's just it's just that simple all right and uh, you've got a good ear yeah i got i got a very good ear and there isn't that lot of aspect when it comes to writing that relates to acting all right the way like uh, uh two actors would improvise or something like that but it's not there's not that show offy uh, uma has a great line about it she goes look if an actor is improvising and they're not using curse words, that's not improvise. That's not improvisation. That's writing. All mm -hmm. right. That's why you never see it. All right. If they're going to improvise, they're going to cuss. Yeah. All right. And so what happens is I just get the characters talking to each other. And what you're trying to do is create an environment as you're writing that Quentin isn't doing it. They're doing it. Quentin starts it off. Quentin knows the direction it's supposed to go. But then the characters take it over. All right. And then like an uh, analogy I'll make is, OK, uh, say I'm going to write a scene. I'm going to get to the coffee cup right, right over here and I'm heading him that way. And then all of a sudden the characters make a left turn and they start going over here. Well, that's OK, because that could end up being the best stuff in the in the whole scene. Eventually, they'll work their way over here if they're supposed to go over here. Yeah. If they never get their way back there again, well, that was Quentin's idea and it wasn't yeah. a good one and they were keeping me <laughs> It's no secret that Kill Bill was first envisioned to be a single movie, but the production bloated with ideas as it was being shot, and it was suggested to Tarantino, who's not known for cutting things short, that he should separate it into two movies. A clever suggestion, as anyone who has enjoyed the first film is guaranteed to view the following, doubling the ticket sales. An idea that proved so lucrative it was copied by many other films. Kill Bill Volume 2 was released six months later. Looked dead, didn't I? Well, I wasn't. But it wasn't from lack of trying, I can tell you that. Actually, Bill's last bullet put me in a coma. A coma I was to lie in for four years. When I woke up, I went on what the movie advertisements refer to as a roaring rampage of revenge. I roared. And I rampaged, and I got bloody satisfaction. I've killed a hell of a lot of people to get to this point. But I have only one more. The last one. The one I'm driving to right now. The only one left. And when I arrive at my destination, I am gonna kill Bill. We open on a close-up shot of the bride. She restates her aims directly to camera. She is going to kill Bill. Chapter 6, a flashback to just before the church massacre. The bride is going through rehearsals for her wedding to a record store owner. The bride's former lover, Bill, shows up and he asks if he could be a guest. The bride passes him off as her estranged father. The deadly Viper assassin squad turn up and shoot the shit out of the place. Back to present day. Bill and one of his goons, Bud, recap the events of the first film at Bud's trailer in the middle of the desert. Bill warns him that the bride is coming for him, and he shrugs it off. Chapter 7. Bud turns up late for his job, working the door in a titty bar, and is promptly fired. He returns home where the bride is waiting for him under his trailer. Her attempted attack is thwarted when she's shot with rock salt. Bud drugs the bride and then drives her to the middle of nowhere and buries her alive. Chapter 8, Flashback. 
Many years ago, back when the bride and Bill were still a couple, Bill speaks of Pai Mei, a kung fu master with whom the bride will train. Bill drops the bride off at a temple where she meets the legendary Pai Mei, who proves to be something of a taskmaster. He teaches her to punch through wood from three inches. Back to the bride in the coffin, she frees herself from the ropes, punches her way out and climbs to freedom. Chapter 9. Ellie Driver, another one of the bride's assailants, arrives at Bud's trailer where she purchases the bride's sword from Bud, but then double crosses him by putting a poisonous snake in the case. It kills Bud. The bride kicks her way into the trailer and the two women have one hell of a sword fight, from which the bride emerges the victor. Last chapter. The bride meets a pimp called Esteban, who we're told in voiceover is a father figure for the eponymous Bill. The bride asks him where Bill is. The bride breaks into Bill's house and is shocked to see the daughter she didn't know was still alive. All intent to kill is diffused. The bride and her daughter spend some time together, watch a movie, and then her and Bill chat. There's a flashback back to when the bride first found out she's pregnant, and there was an attempt on her life. Back to the bride and Bill having a bit more of a chat, then bish bash bosh, she kills him. May I have a glass of water, please? This film, for the most part, is a refreshing drink of water. If the last film was a tribute to Eastern films, then this is a tribute to the West. The pace is a little slower than the first film, focusing on the dialogue rather than the action. And there are some cracking lines in here. You pretty good with that shotgun? Not that I have to be at this range, but I'm a fucking surgeon with this shotgun. Well, guess what, bitch? I'm better than Annie Oakley and I got you right in my sight. What I like is how Tarantino writes his characters into a box, literally in the example of the coffin scene, and then with no feasible way out, he'll cut to a flashback explaining how they're going to solve this problem. It's the slumdog millionaire approach to exposition. Then talk to me about the editing process, because uh -huh. someone once said that Fred Astaire talked about dancing. He said, you know, what I do, I create a 30 minute piece, then I cut it in half mm -hmm. and then I take two more minutes off. Yeah, yeah. That's uh -huh. the way you do it. I mean, right, yeah. is that what happens So you? create this dialogue mm -hmm. or when you put it on the page, is mm -hmm. it pretty much there? Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, well, I think you should get it on the page. You get it to exactly where you where you want it to be. We're like, OK, it's right there. Like if, if the studio said, you know, take out a line. No, I won't do the movie. It'll not work without that. All right. But that's how the page is supposed to be. All right. Yes. But then you do, then you do the scene. And once you get the actors together and everything, it's like, okay, uh, lose that line. That's a crappy line. Okay. That was, that's a dud. All right. Lose that one. Hey, how about say this instead? I mean, just you monkey with it just a little bit. That's fine tuning. Yeah. That's just fine tuning. But then when I get in the editing room, then when it comes to the dialogue scenes, you know, even though some people might disagree with it after seeing all the dialogue scenes I have, how long they are, uh, I'm pretty brutal with it. All right. It's like, okay, screw that line that's no good screw that line that's no good and I, and I start then I start trying to pack it in but is it because it's no good or because you simply have to make it tighter 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 no no no. I'll never cut a dialogue scene just for like a running time or just for thing. no but just for momentum and rhythm and all that yeah no 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 if it's all good then it's all good <laughs> but for me it takes a wrong turn when the words last chapter appear on screen the child being alive is a great twist but what I want at this point is the mother of all knife fights what I get is some blather about Superman now, a staple of the superhero mythology is there's the superhero and there's the alter ego. Batman is actually Bruce Wayne. Spider-Man is actually Peter Parker. When that character wakes up in the morning, he's Peter Parker. He has to put on a costume to become Spider-Man. And it is in that characteristic that Superman stands alone. Superman didn't become Superman. Superman was born Superman. When Superman wakes up in the morning, he's Superman. It's a keen observation, but feels utterly out of character. When has Bill expressed any interest in comic books? He doesn't wear a Superman t-shirt or have a Batman keychain. He's never mentioned comic books at any point. In fact, he seems like the sort of guy who thinks comic books are just for kids. His alter ego is Clark Kent. His outfit with the big red S. That's the blanket he was wrapped in as a baby when the Kents found him. Those are his clothes. This dialogue feels like it was cut out of something else. 
If Clarence in True Romance was spouting it, I'd say fair enough. But not only is it a strange thing to say, but it's also a strange time to say it. Knife fight! Knife fight! Knife fight! Knife fight! What Kent wears, the glasses, the business suit, that's the costume. That's the costume Superman wears to blend in with us. Then there's this flashback to when the bride finds out she's pregnant. There are some sparkling lines in this scene and it has an interesting dilemma at its core. But why is this happening now? What information is this adding? Did you know there was a time when the bride didn't know she was pregnant? Well, that's hardly news. Did you know someone tried to kill the bride once? Well, no shit, Sherlock, that's the plot. On the floor by the door is a strip that says I'm pregnant. Bullshit. <laughs> Any other time, you'd be 100% right. But this time, you're 100% wrong. The script for this movie was leaked online between the release of Volume 1 and 2. It was an early draft from when it was designed to be a single film, but in that draft, this scene still existed, but in a completely different point. It's like Tarantino couldn't throw it out when that other sequence changed and jammed it somewhere where it doesn't fit. And right when I want a knife fight, I don't know what this fucking shit means. The box with the directions is right there. Anyway, when it cuts back to Bill and the bride, there's still more talking. This is where the old screenwriting rule about show don't tell should come into play because they're talking about a massive knife fight. I feel like I'm being teased now. As we all know, Tarantino is capable of shooting a cinematic fight, but for some reason I'm getting close up, close up, two shot. And then just when things look like they're building up to something, bang. It's all over. It's like cinematic premature ejaculation. In a film so filled with subversions of expectations, it's like the only trick left in Tarantino's bag was to disappoint. There were any number of ways this film could have ended, apart from a knife fight that I so wanted, the bride could have taken the child and left. She's got the child, no need for revenge. Or her and Bill could have rekindled their love. Or she could have pretended that she was still in love with him, only so she could get close enough to kill him. Or almost anything other than what happened. As that was the low point of four hours of movie making that I was really enjoying up till then. Also, while we're here, as well acted as it undeniably is, I could do without the Esteban scene too. It feels more like an audition piece than part of the jigsaw. All the bride does is ask for an address. Is there no more cinematic way to do that? Where's Bill? Uh, you must be Beatrix. That is just my opinion, of course. Take it or leave it as you wish. You know what they say about opinions and assholes. If you have the former, then you are the latter. James Rolfe of Angry Video Game Nerd fame created a fan edit of these films, trimming them down and then combining them together. He discussed the changes he made in this video here. Act 1. Right off the bat, start with the wedding scene from Volume 2. We don't need those parts with the bride driving the car, telling us the whole recap. Just start with the wedding. That's the event that catapults the whole story. When she's talking with Bill there, we can sense his jealousy and it tells us everything we need to know. It builds up tension and then, by only making minor cuts, we get the squad to appear right before the 10 minute mark. They walk into the church, then you hear the gunfire. And as soon as it quiets down, let's hear the track Battle Without Honor or Humanity. I believe that's the most memorable song of the whole movie, which I've always thought of as the Kill Bill theme. With its funk rock style, it sounds just like something out of a Grindhouse film. I'll let you find the video yourself if you want to hear about the changes in full. Obviously I haven't seen the version described, but from the pricey it sounds really exciting. That's not me getting down on the original films. Tarantino firing at 90% is still head, shoulders and waist above the competition. Tarantino himself made a combined edit of the films and titled it The Whole Bloody Affair, which I also haven't seen, but from what I've read, it's basically the two films back to back with only minor changes. Oh, you know, no, Kill Bill's one. I, okay, I, cons I consider Kill Bill one. one. Okay, that's right. I would consider Kill Bill two if I wanted to just stop at once upon a time. Yeah. Right. And you know, I mean, the only one I can imagine where I would 
where it would be another epic where I need to outdo everything is if I did a Kill Bill 3. Have you thought of that? I've thought of it, yeah. I mean, it's you already have these two epic films. Is there like something that you felt was unresolved in the first two, or would you like to revisit the characters? Well, I think it's just I, I think it's just uh, um, revisiting the characters twenty years later. Just imagining the bride and her daughter Bibi having twenty years of peace, and like then that peace is shattered, and now like. Uh, um, the bride and her daughter, bride and BB, are on the run, and the, you know, just the idea of being able to cast Uma and, and cast her daughter Maya, and the thing would be fucking exciting. Yeah, no, you know, and L Driver's still out there. Sophie Fatale got her arms cut off. She's still out there. Right, right, <laughs> they right. They all got Bill's money. Yeah. Actually, uh, 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 Gogo -Go had a twin sister, Shiaki. All right, uh, 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 and so like her twin sister could show up. <laughs> Sadly, Kill Bill Volume 3 is unlikely to be made, by Tarantino at least, as he's decided to make only 10 films, or 11 if you count Kill Bill as 2, which it is 2, you can tell that because you had to pay twice, but he's decided to end on a high, which is what I plan to do. A big thank you goes out to Squabblebox for asking me to make this video. I also have my own YouTube channel, it's called I'm Making a Movie. I call it that because I'm making a movie. If you've enjoyed this, why not subscribe to that? I'm Scott Kingsnorth, and I'm making a movie.